<clears throat> All right, that's good. Just making sure that the uh, recording is not going to be a silent movie, you know, because I need to make sure the audio is all connected. <clears throat> all right, that's the time. Perfect. So it is noontime. Um, I'm going to get the class started. I'm Tack. I'm your professor for CISP 440. So it's going to be a long semester. <laughs> This is a this is okay. It's both a fast semester and a slow semester because you know there's a lot of content to this class. Um, so I think time is going to fly by, but you're going to have to put in a lot of effort into this class as well. So the whole thing about you know for each hour of lecture, you're supposed to spend two additional hours to study, to let the material sink in, to do the homework, and so on. That is true for this class. Okay, so make sure that you budget enough time to take this class, okay? All right, so as you can see, you know, th this is note to self um, that I have prepared for myself on my tablet. So occasionally, you can see it's, you know, switching between the orientation because, you know, it's actually live, you know, connecting to my uh, tablet using Wi-Fi. There we go. Um, so make sure that you have done everything that you need to do to meet the requirements for the prerequisite, which is math 372, and also the co-requisite requirement, which is CISP 430. Do we have any questions about those two requirements? Because I, when I check the grade, I see quite a few people still have you know, either a zero or a dash over one for those activities on Canvas. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> so the idea for CISP 430 is to go to eSurfaces. I can actually show you how to do that. So go to eSurfaces you know, for Los Rios. Go to the student portal. Okay. You might need me to sign in again. So, because I'm also an employee, you know, you don't, you, you probably won't see the employee, you know, self-service. You, you can just go straight to student homepage, go to your um, academic records, and then from here, go to your view unofficial transcript, and then click on submit. <clears throat> so this way, you know, you can download your uh, transcript. I don't really need to know your grade for, you know, your other classes. So, you know, some people have already done that. You know, they use a PDF editor and just kind of block out everything else that I do not need to know, okay? If you want to leave those grades into your transcript, that's fine too. I'm not going to read it, okay? You know, that's just using extra time and I got stuff to do. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> so, this is how you can show me that you are currently enrolled in CISP 430. If you have taken CISP 430 already, that activity would have a one over one already, and there is nothing that you need to do to stay in this class. Is that okay? So do this before Friday, because on Friday, I'll be looking at those two requirements, and anyone who missed at least one of those two requirements will be dropped. Question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So you go to yeah. I don't have you know any active classes I'm taking. The most important point is you know your name has to be on the document that you're printing out or uploading to me. Okay. All right. So that works too. All right. So there are multiple ways to do this. You know, but I got you know certain screenshots from a cell phone. You know, where there's no name whatsoever. It's just like okay, there's this class. It's like okay, but how does that relate to you? So, so your method works too. Excellent. Are there any additional questions or suggestions about the prerequisite or the co-requisite requirement for this class? All right, <clears throat> I don't see any questions, so we can get ahead, go ahead and get started with this class. So there we go.
All right. So I have you know, posted quite a few announcements already for this class. Um, so make sure that your uh, email or the announcement is connected to your email. So this way, you know, as soon as I post an announcement, you get it by email. So you won't miss anything important. The syllabus is already, um, you know, I talked about the syllabus using a video. So I'm assuming that you have read the syllabus and or watched the syllabus, you know, video. If not, please do that as soon as possible. Okay. Um, and that's why I don't have to spend time to talk about the syllabus, you know, today because, you know, you have already watched it. It's already, you know, you know, in a readable format. So I don't have to kind of use the extra time to do this. Um, there's a shared folder here. It's not usually useful, you know, until later on, but if you want to explore what is in a shared folder, you can do so. It is a Google Drive that I have set up to host, you know, a number of files that may be useful for this class. And that's going to change, you know, as we move on in this class. So I might create additional files um, throughout the semester. And these two are the activities that you should check to make sure that you receive a one over one for both of them. Okay, so um, I'm going to move on. <clears throat> At any time, if you have any questions, you know, you can just go ahead and raise your hand and let me know. Um, I'm totally okay with you know, being interrupted, you know, because you know, I really prefer a class that is more interactive. Probably not. <laughs> That's okay. Not a problem. So you might want to go to room 301, which is the, you know, the main lab that is in that direction, and then uh, check with those people at the counter. You know, they, they would know what to do with you. Yeah, sure. Not a problem. As I was saying, I don't mind getting interrupted. So you know, if you have questions, you know, let me know. If you need more time to digest what I just said, let me know, because otherwise, I do not know. I cannot read your mind. I don't want to read your mind. So I, I cannot tell whether you have questions or whether you want me to pause you know, or slow down. You know, okay? So if you need that, you know, just let me know. All right. So we are moving on. Okay, there are some interesting links here. Uh, this is a MBTI or Meyer Briggs you know, type indicator, your know, personality type kind of checking thing. Uh, but I found that the college also has Pathway U, which is an assessment um, that would kind of find out, you know, what aligns, you know, what kind of career aligns best, you know, based on your interest and your aptitudes. Um, I know some people may think, I think it may be too late. This is the capstone class, you know, I'm about to transfer. I can tell you a lot of stories about why it is not too late, okay? You know, but if you ever want to do an assessment like that, just look up Pathway U, Pathway U as one word, and American River College. It is a paid service, but since you're a student enrolled in Los Rios, it is free to you. In other words, you, know, you can take this test, you know, this is an assessment, and you can take the assessment you know, for free. You know, it's already paid for, so you know, it's, it's just one of those things. You know, if you want to kind of like double check and confirm that computer science is my niche, you know, this is a good tool to have a confirmation. All right, so now we can actually get started. So we're going to start with Boolean operators, uh, which is a, I consider this a little warm up session, you know, that connects you back to the programming classes that you have taken already. So we'll go ahead and do this. And all the reading material for this class are linked from the Canvas shell. There's no textbook to purchase, and this is all available already. I don't have anything locked and say, oh, but until we get to that time, until you, you pass this particular you know, assessment, you, know, you cannot view the next you know, module. They're already here, okay? So if anyone wants to read way ahead of the entire class, you can do that, okay? You, know, you can read ahead of the class you know, at any pace you want, but just you know, don't read behind the class. That would not be recommended. All right, so we're gonna talk about Boolean operators today and possibly set notations depending on how much time we have. Um, I'm just double checking that the recorder is still on. 
<clears throat> some of you may be a little curious of why I wear the mic on my glasses. What do you think? Yes, in a strange way, because you know, the, ampl the amplifier of the mic is too good, but it's not adjustable. So if I clip it here, I'm going to saturate the mic, which means it's not going to sound very good. You know, it's going to miss you know, certain things. But if I put it here, it just gives me enough distance so I don't saturate the mic unless I yell at people, which I hope I don't have to. <laughs> because that's bad for my voice, too. <clears throat> All right, so I'm just keeping an eye on the mic, you know, just to make sure that everything is still going. All right, so we are going to take a, make a really, really quick review of Boolean operators from your other classes. Um, so that's section three, common C, C++ Boolean operators. You know, um, this is actually wrong, okay, I lied. These are all the C and C++ Boolean operators. There are only three. The first one is conjunction, which you know as AND. So do we have any questions about the conjunction or AND operator in C++? First of all, okay, I'm just double checking. Okay, so what is the, what does the operator look like for conjunction, for a logical AND? What does it look like in C++? Go ahead. Double ampersand, ampersand, ampersand. Is that different from a single ampersand? What is a single ampersand? I guess. Well, if it's a, if, when it's used as a unary operator, it is the address of, but it can also be used as a binary operator. So when the ampersand symbol is used as a binary operator, what do you think it represents? Bitwise AND, very good, okay? So bitwise AND and logical AND are two different operators. They are related. They may even be interchangeable in many cases, but they are not the same, okay? I'm not, this is not a C++ class. I'm not gonna go any further to talk about, you know, the differences between a bitwise AND versus a logical AND, but you might want to look into it if that is what you're interested. All right. So in this class, we are only interested in bitwise AND, at least at this point. <clears throat> so the English word is just AND, and the mathematical uh, symbol is kind of like a little TP. So X and Y is, you know, you know, it looks like this to a mathematician. This is a truth table. So what a truth table does is it enumerates every possible way to have values on the two sides of a single operator and come up with the value of the expression using that operator. So to explain this, it means, I'm just gonna take the second row here. So on the second row, it means when x is the zero, y is a one, then x and y is gonna be a zero. In this class, instead of you know, writing true or false, I use one to represent true, and zero to represent false, okay? Mostly because it is just easier to type it that way, but also because in abstract algebra, it is not uncommon that zero represents false and one represents true. Do we have any questions about the notation, about you know, zero represents false and then one represents true? Nope, okay, very good. <clears throat> Do we understand how a truth table works in this case? Okay, excellent. All right. Um, so in this case, I also talk about the alternative representations of conjunction. This is what you see in C++. This is what mathematicians like to use. This is, these two are for computer engineers and also electrical engineers. So in electrical engineering and or computer engineering, um, they don't use the math symbol you know, of the little TP symbol. Um, tip, sometimes they use a single dot uh, so that it looks like multiplication. And then other times they don't even bother with the dot here and it just looks like X times Y, but it really means X and Y. 
So there are different ways to represent your know, conjunction, and I just want to give you all the different ways. So in this class, later on, we are going to use this notation, x, y, which looks like x times y, is actually representing x and y. All right. Moving on to the other, you know, boring, boring operator in C++, it's disjunction, otherwise known as or, and this is the truth table of or. Okay, so or looks like a little v here in, mathemat in mathematical symbol. It's, you don't have to use that particular symbol in this class. And the notations that we want to get used to is, are listed here. X or Y looks like this in C++. It looks like this to mathematicians and then to, soft, to computer engineers and also electrical engineers. It looks like a regular plus. It looks like addition to um, computer engineers. Um, I think the reason why it looks like that is because it's easier to type on the regular keyboard. Because you know, the V symbol here is not that easy. Okay, Even though it looks like a V, it's not a V. For those of you who want to learn how to enter mathematical notations, which later on can be handy, you can always right click on one and then go to show math as and then go to tech commands. This is an industry standard way to enter mathematical uh, formulae. Okay? If you don't want to learn this, it's fine. It's not going to be in any exams in this class. On the other hand, if you want to type your notes okay, using a computer and you want everything to look neat, you want all the equations to look exactly the way they're supposed to be, then learning LaTeX is actually going to be a useful skill. Are we doing okay so far? All right, okay. So moving on to negation, which is the last of the three logical operators that are defined in C, C++, and most other programming languages. So negation is just not, okay? So in English, it's just not. The mathematical notation looks like a little cliff, okay? And you know, not zero is a one, or not false is true. Not true is false. So the truth table is a little bit simpler because this is a unary operator instead of a binary operator. I'm just going to pause here because I threw out some terms, okay? I want to make sure that you guys all understand what I mean when I said a unary operator as opposed to a binary operator. Are there any questions about these two terms? Yep. Oh, you first and then you. Yep. Unary basically means that it applies to only one variable, and binary means that it applies to two. It has two sides. Yeah. So binary means you know there are two values that you have to supply to the operator in order for the operator to come up with this with the ex, with the value of the expression, and then a numeri, numeri operator only has one operand, which means it, you only need to give it one piece of information and then it give you a value. Go ahead. Oh, okay, great. Okay, excellent. So binary operator in this case does not mean that we're working with binary number as in base two. It simply means that there are two things that you have to give it. Yep. All right, so these, these, these are the easy ones. And I do want to go over the notations, okay? Because you know, most of us want to know, you know what, what am I expecting when you need to enter these um, Boolean expressions? So this is the notation using an exclamation point is the notation that we use in C, C++, and many other languages that are C-based. Uh, so that would include Java. It would include JavaScript. It would include a whole bunch, okay? There are many, many programming languages that are based on C and C++. Mathematicians like to do it this way. So that little cliff thing, the way you enter that in LaTeX is backslash neg, N-E-G for negation. Um, this one is used a lot in circuit design. You know, putting a bar on top of the expression that you want to negate, <clears throat> but it's also difficult to enter because you have to use an over bar and then you have to lot, use LaTeX to render it. Um, and then the slash is also used to mean negation. And this particular notation is used also a lot in electronics. So if you read the um, data sheet of chips, okay, of you know processors and so on, you will also you will find you know people using the slash symbol to mean negated 
um, when we're looking at the pins on the processor or the pins of an FPGA and so on and so forth. All right, so, but from the perspective of being easy to enter and also easy to read, I am going to use the exclamation point in this class. Um, the slash is really easy to put in, but it's also very confusing because we have division. Okay, so that makes it a little bit harder to um, parse, but you know, the exclamation point is pretty easy to enter on the keyboard, and it's also pretty clear what that means because in this class, I mean, okay, at some point in this class, it's going to be confusing because we also have to talk about factorial. So in factorial, the exclamation point is also a unit operator, but it goes to the other side of whatever, you know, of the number that you, you want to find the factorial of. So, but by that time, you know, there should be no confusing based on confusion based on the context of the expression. All right, so now we're going to go talk about some operators or Boolean operators or logical, I should say, logical operators that is uncommon, okay? So the first one is NAND, okay? So NAND, which stands for negated AND, is really just that, okay? It is negated AND. That's all it is. So when you look at the truth table, I did not give you the truth table here for a reason, because I want you to think about it, okay? So if the definition of NAND, which looks like an up arrow, if you want to enter that as a symbol, all that really is is the negation of the AND between two things. So if I want to come up with the truth table of negated AND or NAND, what do you think that is going to look like? So that's kind of the question. Um, let me see if I can get back to my super note here. Right, turn it back on. Oh, it has lost connection. It's not exactly a proven technology because I have, yep, doesn't like it. Okay, that's fine. You know, it's just a table, so I can use text, just a regular text editor to approximate it. All right, so go to accessories, mouse pad. There we go. All right. Okay, so when high tech doesn't work, you just go for low tech. If this doesn't work, I can go to the whiteboard. Okay, I can go lower tech and lower tech until we can no longer use the classroom. Then we go outside, I'll find a stick, I'll find some place that is sandy, and then we'll just you know, put your, our you know, representation on sand. So we'll, we'll keep teaching this class no matter what. All right, so this is X, this is Y, and this is the negation of X and Y. So I'm just using C++ notation here. And this is one thing that is really great about the Boolean algebra. With normal algebra, where you deal with integers or real numbers and stuff like that, there is no way you can enumerate or list and you know, basically look at all the possible cases. Why not? Go ahead. Exactly, because there's an infinite number of integers, okay? And so there's no way you can come up with a table and go like, okay, this defines that operator. It just doesn't work. But with Boolean algebra, each independent variable can only be zero or one, true or false, you know, regardless of how you call that. There are only two choices, two possible values for each independent variables. So that means, oh, so that means you know, zero can only be false or true, when, y, when x is false, y can be false or true, when x is true, y can also be false or true. Ah, okay, there are only four possible cases. So what should go onto this row here when I evaluate the negation of x and y, when x is false, y is also false? Going to be true, right? <clears throat> what about this row here? True. What about this one? True. And what about this one? False. False. Okay. So that means, you know, I can just invent, you know, my own Boolean operator or logical operator. In this case, it's the NAND. And I can just come up with, you know, the truth table. I can define it that way. Is that okay? 
All right. So now we go back to get back to my notes, which I think it's here. Here we go. All right. So what is so special about NAND? Because you know, did you guys study NAND in C plus plus or object oriented programming? Hmm. So and so. What do you mean? Okay. In which class? Four hundred. Okay. So I'm I'm a little bit surprised, you know, because you know typically people don't talk about NAND. So now the question is, what is so special about NAND? Well, one thing that NAND can do is it can it can be used to reproduce all of the other Boolean operators. In other words, if we want a the sim, the most simplistic programming language, all we really need is NAND. You don't need negation. You don't need conjunction. You don't need disjunction. All we need is NAND, and that's because you can use NAND to define all of the other operators that we are used to. The negation of x is nothing more than just x NAND x. X and y is x NAND x. Excuse, excuse me. X and y is x NAND y NAND x NAND y. And then x or y is x nand x nand y nand y. I have just made a whole bunch of claims. So what are you gonna what are you gonna do? But some many of you this is for many of you this is the first time you take my classes, but my suggestion is don't trust me. Okay. Pretend that I have been trying to trick you the entire time, okay? So what you need to do is to say, okay, can I verify this on my own? Have I learned enough techniques and skills and knowledge to kind of prove that negation of x is really just x nand x? Have I you know, learned enough material to prove that x and y is really the same thing as x nand y nand? X nand y. What do you think the answer is? Yep. Exactly. So this is one thing. What the other great thing about Boolean algebra is a proof can boil down to just populating a truth table. It's not algebra, algebra where you have to remember, oh, commutative rule, and then this is you know the associative rule, this is this distribution, and so on. Nope, all you have to do is to work it out. Okay, so I'll give you the template. I'm not going to do it, but I'll give you the template, and you can do it on your own. Okay, because I want you guys to understand that yes, you have already learned enough to prove every single one of these three claims that I have just made. Okay, so I'll give you the template as a text file. So we have x, y again, and once again, x is Boolean, y is Boolean. So while x is false or true, y can be false or true. While, you know, when x is true, y can be false or true. Okay, so this part stays the same because we have two independent variables. <clears throat> so the next part is to go like, okay, uh, let's talk about x and y. Okay, so we have x and y as one column, and then I claim that this is the same thing as x nand y. The whole thing nand x and x nand y. So if you want to kind of make it a little bit easier on yourself, you can always use you know this for x nand y, and then you and then you have another column for doing the uh, nand between x nand y and x nand y. So that's going to look a little bit ugly, okay? Because that's going to look like this. That's x nand y nand x nand y. There we go. So populate you know, all the columns here 
here and then use that to help you with this here. And I forgot it's supposed to be double ampersand. Okay, so let me put an extra ampersand here. All right, so in this case, if the values for this column for X and Y ends up to be exactly the same as the values for the last column or the rightmost column, which is X NAND Y NAND X NAND Y, then I have just proven the equivalence between this and this. So it boils down to just spending time to do it. There's no special technique whatsoever. And for some of you, it's like, okay, I can write programs to do this. I can use a double loop, you know, one loop to, for X to go from zero to one, and then a nested loop for Y to go from zero to one. And then I can, just print, I can print out you know, the values for those two expressions. That's another great way to do it, okay? How long would it take you to write that program? Sorry? <laughs> Ridiculously long, yes. When you count it in milliseconds. <laughs> so these are little things that you can do, okay? Every time you do something like this, you are learning a new tool that you, will, you may find useful later on. Maybe not in this class. Maybe even not you know, when you're taking classes at ARC or even taking classes anywhere. Okay, but these are all little tricks and little techniques that can be useful when you become um, an employee, okay, a software engineer or a developer and so on, you know, because you're basically just building up, you know, your competency, your skills, and your understanding of the material. All right, so I'm going to claim that you can do about the same thing for X or Y, okay, you know, just kind of work this out, you know, kind of re-express it in a way that you know, C++ understands. Or you can also use macros or functions to define your own NAND, okay? You know, that's not hard. And then you can all, you know, you can verify every single one of these equivalences here. Do we have any questions about this part here? That NAND is all you need. All right, so my watch just buzzed me, which is a reminder that I'm gonna take roll. And the way I take role in this class is for you guys to sign in to Canvas. You can do this with a cell phone. You can do this on your laptop. You know, if you can use the workstation that is in front of you, you know, any way to sign into Canvas is fine. And today is 2024, so I'm gonna make it visible, okay? So if you sign in already, you have to refresh the page to see this. And it will give, it will ask you for an access code and I cannot remember the access code, I have to look at it too. It is implication. <clears throat> so for anyone who do not have a device, well, okay, that should not exist anyway because you guys all have a workstation in front of you. <laughs> do we have any problems, you know, signing in and confirming that you are in class today. We all good? Okay. All right. You should be able to sign in because I... Um, you, so when am I going to give you a permission number, right? Is that your question? Um, probably by the end of today um, because you know, anyone who's missing today's class, they're going to be dropped. All right, so let me just remind the person who just walked in. So I'm taking row right now. You need to sign into Canvas and go to the row taking activity, which is today's date, you know, row taking. And then the access code is implication. Okay. All right. I'm gonna write it on the whiteboard. Okay, just so that, you know, for people who want to do it offline a little bit, you know, it's on the whiteboard. There we go. So we're going to continue with our lecture material. So the next operator is implication. That's why, you know, implication, 
is the passcode or the access code of today's role taking activity because I kind of knew that I would be around this topic you know at this time I never planned out anything you know if you have taken classes from Damon Damon Antos he plans out everything down to the minute at the beginning of a class I don't do that I just go like well let me see what should I talk about next you know that's kind of more like me but you know that's my this is kind of like my magical way of syncing things up too you know even though I did not I don't plan for that all right so this is implication so implication looks like a a weird thing to be its own operator okay but it's okay I can define an operator to be called blah blah or yada yada it doesn't matter okay because all I need to do is to give you the truth table for that operator then it is defined so implication is defined in two different ways the best way to look at implication is to look at the truth table that's I think you know I would recommend that way but it does, it's not the only way so when you look at implication in the truth table it means zero implies zero is a one zero implies one is a one one implies zero is a zero one implies one is a one okay so for those of you who are more mechanically inclined which means you know you do not seek deep meaning in things you know, unless there's a necessity but for the most part you can just take things you know at its face value the truth table is the best way to understand implication because that really spells out what implication is but some of you are going like okay but I don't like this method is there another way to understand implication sure the other way to understand implication is x implies y is really saying the same thing as the negation of x the whole thing or y they boil down to exactly the same thing I just made another claim what claim did I make I claimed that if I define x implies y to be the negation of x or y then it would be the same as this truth table here the truth table way of defining x implies y that, that was a claim okay even though I did not use the word claim it was a claim so what are you going to do you just jot down text said blah 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 and therefore it has to be the case no you can test it how do you test it the truth table exactly are you guys getting bored already because I would be it's like okay we just use a truth table to prove all of these claims yes it's that's exactly what it is okay make a truth table with X Y okay you know, with these two columns and then with one column corresponding to the negation of X or Y and then see if that column looks exactly the same as this column here if they look exactly the same then that my claim is true okay now you can just say that you, you can just think that okay if tax sets you know these are verifiable it has to be verified already and I don't have to do it that's one way to look at it but if you do it on your own okay um, I think you will understand these things better okay because it just builds a different pathway in your mind to connect the concepts there's a big difference between listening and writing between reading and writing okay that's why taking notes is important I know I'm sidetracking a little bit but I think this is actually important not only for this class but also for many other classes too there's a book called I think it's called building a second brain building a second brain it has its own website yep okay so that's good um, you don't have to buy the book okay go to the library okay if our library doesn't have it go check it out from a public library if a public library doesn't have it you can sign up for I think uh, there are some websites here where they give you a synopsis of books and so on and so forth because you don't really need to read the entire book okay you just need to get the general idea of this book here what do you think it talks about 
It has nothing to do with brain surgery, so relax. We are not going to teach you how to use a drill and a saw so you can actually attach a second brain to your brain. What is it? What do you think it is about? Go ahead. Better note-taking methods, not study methods, just note-taking. Because do you, who do you think need to take notes? All of you here, right? Who else? I need to take notes, okay? If I attend a workshop to learn something new, I need to take notes. If I want to learn about something that is new to me, like entirely new to me, I have to take notes, like really, really good notes. So taking notes as a technique is not only limited to benefit students. It will benefit anyone who needs to work on complicated concepts, okay? And do you think, okay, let me, let me roll back a little bit. What is, your, what is your plan in the next four years? Graduate, get a job. Okay, very good. So do you think your job is going to be like, oh, it's just going to be a push over? I don't have to learn anything after college. You know, I'm done after I get my bachelor's of science. I'm good. That used to be true in, I would say, the late 80s or even the 90s. It is not true anymore, okay? So what does it mean for you? You're constantly learning, and not even from books, okay? By the, by the time something is in print, it is outdated. <laughs> um, I used to teach a class in mobile uh, programming or mobile device programming. Um, by the time you get a book on Android programming, by the time they document the API in a book, by the time you hold on to that book as a physical thing, it's already outdated because the API changes on a weekly basis. The tool, okay, the development kit changes on a weekly basis. Okay, so that means you have to learn constantly as well. Okay, and at some point, you know, Android or you know, Google decided we're not going to program Android devices using Java anymore. We're going to invent this entire new programming language called what? Coupling? Cannot remember. But it's a programming, it's a new programming language. So what do you do? You have to learn that new programming language on your own. So learning something new is going to come with the territory if you want to get into anything in ICT, which stands for Information and Communication Technology. The C is not computing, it's actually communication, but it includes computer science and all the stuff that we do in this class. Why do you think that is the case? What about all those jobs that are easy, okay? You know, I just have to keep doing the same thing every day, the same way, every single time. What happened to those jobs? They got automated, okay? Exactly. All the easy jobs are automated already. And AI is pushing what can be automated to also include some things that we used to think are intellectual type of you know, jobs, okay? And that envelope is gonna change because of technology and also because of you know, you know, research, active research in artificial intelligence. So that envelope is gonna change. Where it is now is not going to be the same when you graduate from a four-year university. And then we also have Moore's Law to talk about, too, right? What is Moore's Law? M-O-O-R-E, Moore. <laughs> it is depressing to think about it, but it is true. We, we cannot just go like, no, it's not true. I don't have to worry about it. What is Moore's Law? Go ahead. Yep, so it, it's technically, it means you know, the transistor size you know, or the density of transistor doubles. Originally, it was every 18 months. Now it is every 24 months, which is every two years. So it has slowed down a little bit, okay? But it's not dead. So what it means is for the same money, using the same resources, the computer that you buy would have twice the processing resources, twice the capacity in every way, every two years. So that means, when are you going to graduate? When are you going to get your bachelor's degree? 
at least two more years, right? So everything will double within that time frame, which also means you know OpenAI would have twice as much processing power to learn you know languages or whatever algorithm they come up. You know it would have twice the capacity to store everything that humanity has created. Okay, so in a way you know it's a moving target. There's no way to for anyone to predict what it's going to look like when you graduate with your bachelor's degree and you're looking for jobs. So what you need to do is to keep yourself up to date with everything, but most importantly, make sure that you sharpen your mind. Make sure that you focus on things that you can do, but AI cannot do. Which means you have to focus, you also have to learn what AI can do, and then also understand what it cannot do, okay? All right. I know it sounds really scary, but you know you have time to prepare. Okay, it is a matter of preparation. All right. So, um, are there any questions about implication as an operator? No questions about implication. All right. Now, implication is one of those really, really strange operator that you don't really need to use in your other programming classes until now. So that means, you know, from here on, throughout the semester, there are many cases that will refer back to the definition of the implication operator. And if you take notes, and I hope you're taking notes, okay, I'm gonna just walk past the rows to make sure that people are taking notes and not just twiddling their thumbs. So if you take notes, one thing that you might wanna do is to have a section dedicated only to definitions, okay? So that you, when you need to look up a definition, you know where to look. Now, my notes here, okay, they contain everything, you know, all the definitions, all the discussions, and so on. But if I ask you, find the definition of blah, okay, it's not gonna be easy, okay? Because you didn't write this, okay? And I cannot even remember where I put the definitions. So when you are taking notes, it is important to put all the definitions to one place so that if you need to look up definitions, you have that one place to go to look it up so that you know, it's easier, okay? I think it's gonna be useful. All right, so I'm gonna skip over you know, the uh, verbal description of implication unless somebody wants me to talk about it. Does anyone want to talk about it? Does anyone to talk about you know what happens when you pay me fifty bucks and I just tell you a blue cat is sick implies tomorrow is doomsday and you instantly regret it and go like oh, I want my fifty bucks back. Does anyone want me to talk about it or you guys go like I'm good you know fifty bucks is nothing to me you can have it yes. Okay, so you want your fifty bucks back <laughs> yes. <clears throat> All right, so this is it, okay? I'm using implication, okay? And there are two sides, okay? This is X. X is a statement on its own. A blue cat is sick. It is called a statement. It's called a condition because it can either be true or false, okay? So that is on the left-hand side of the implication, which is also called the precedent. And then the other side of implication, in this case, tomorrow is doomsday, is also just a statement. It's a condition. It can be true. It can be false. Okay? And this is called a consequent. Okay? So we have the precedent on the left-hand side, the consequent on the right-hand side. And you just paid me 50 bucks, and this is all I said. Okay? So now the question is, when do you think you can get your 50 bucks back? Which means, tag what you said is wrong. I'm I'm demanding my fifty bucks. Okay. Yep. And then the next day is not doomsday. That's the only time you can get your refund. Okay. So we'll go through all four possible cases. So the first one is a blue cat is indeed sick today. So on your way to the campus. You found a blue cat, and it is sick. And then tomorrow turns out to be doomsday, 
So in this case, you cannot get your fifty dollars back. Not that that fifty dollars is going to do you any good because tomorrow is doomsday. Is that okay? All right. So that's an easy one because you know you know whatever I said actually happened. So the other one is、um, it is not the case that the blue cat is sick. So on your way to school today, you know, or universally, you just know that there are no blue cats that is sick. Okay. And tomorrow turns out not to be doomsday. Okay, everything is normal tomorrow. Do you think you can get your money back tomorrow? No, you cannot, because I never said anything about what would happen if you cannot find a sick blue cat. Is that okay? That really is the crux. Okay, that really is the most important part of implication. Is I only said what happens when the precedent is true. But I never said anything about what happens when the precedent is false. Okay, so for the same reason, if a blue cat is not sick today and tomorrow turns out to be doomsday, you still cannot get your fifty dollars back, because I never said anything about what happens when a you know, when a blue cat is not sick. So the only time you get your refund back is today. You find a blue cat that is sick, and then tomorrow is indeed not doomsday. That is the only time you can get your fifty dollars back, because what happens tomorrow is not consistent with what I said would happen, based on the condition that the blue cat is sick today. Does that make sense? Okay. Which also, you know, is helpful because if tomorrow is not doomsday, that fifty dollars is actually meaningful. You can use it to do stuff. All right. So moving on. So the last one is called equivalence. So equivalence, okay, x is equivalent to y, can also be written using implication. So in this case, it means x implies y and y implies x. So they are implying each other. That's one way to look at it. The other way to look at it is the truth table.、Um, you can see that in this case, the truth table is just one row off compared to the other one. So false if and if and only if or false is equi equivalent to false is true. Okay, that's good. False is equivalent to one. It's false. That is the only time when if and only if or equivalence is not the same as implication. There are alternative names to equivalence. It is also known as if and only if. In mathematics, if you see the word iff, it means if and only if. It's just a really short way to, you know, describe the same thing. Are we good so far? All right. So we have talked about you know the usual operators that you're used to, negation, conjunction, and disjunction. Okay, those are the things that you learned in your programming classes. But we also introduced that really kind of awkward operator called NAND, which is the quote unquote universal operator because you can define all of the other operators using NAND. But we also talk about these two additional operators, implication and equivalence. Okay, so if you prefer, you can call one, you know, as, as if then, and then the other one is、um, if is if and only if. Those two are introduced in CISP 440 because they have special meaning in logic. Okay, they have applications in logic, and that's why we kind of need to talk about those two. All right, I'm looking at the time. We can continue, so we are moving on to set notations. So let me back out from this one. Okay, get out of here. Get out of here, and then we continue with set notations right here. All right, so this is always kind of a little bit baffling to me. Is you know whether people have exposure prior to this class to set theory or set notations. So, how many people have exposure to set notations before this class? Okay, so we have the minority of the class having some exposure prior to this class, or you know, some people just do not want to respond. <laughs> I can never tell.、Um, but this is really important. Okay, many textbooks would put set notation to after the discussion of functions, relations, stuff like and stuff like that, and that's why I don't use a published textbook because I disagree. With the ordering of topics, I prefer to talk about set notation first, 
because set notation is the vocabulary that we have to use to describe functions and relations and many of the other things that we also have to talk about in this class. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is what is a set and what is an element of a set. Okay, so that's the first concept. The best way to look at this is a folder and files. A folder is basically a set. What is inside a folder are elements in the set. Are there any questions about that analogy? You guys want me to talk about, repeat that statement? Nope, okay. So let's talk about a few things. Um, is there an intrinsic way to order files within a folder? Like this has to be the way that we order the files when we display the content of a folder. Nope, you can sort by file name. You can sort by the date or the time that you last modify a file. You can sort by extension combined with the file name. Um, so there's no intrinsic ordering of items inside a set. Is that part okay? All right, cool. What about having two files of exactly the same name? Can you do that in the same folder? Okay, no. Okay, so every file has to have a unique name. So the, for the same reason, every item inside a set also has to be unique. You cannot have the same thing twice in a set. Is that okay? All right. Um, last one, can it be recursive? Can we have a set that by itself is an element of another set? It translates to, if you want to use the folder analogy, it translates to, can you have a folder inside another folder? I sure hope that you know the answer is yes. <laughs> can you imagine <clears throat> Microsoft Windows just gives you a restriction of, no, we only got the root folder, you cannot create subfolders. Can you imagine what's gonna happen? How do you find your files? How many files do you think exist in a normal installation of Windows? I have no idea. <laughs> Probably tens of thousands, if not more. You have one single folder with tens of thousands of files, and that's before you upload all your pictures from the past 20 years. Okay, some of you are younger. You don't understand. You, know. <laughs> you, you don't understand the, the magnitude of pictures. Ask your parents. Okay, so it's the same thing with, you know, with the set notation. A set can contain other sets, okay? Now, there's a big difference between a set containing a set in the sense that it has everything that the other set has and also the containment as in, oh, you are one of my items, okay? So we'll clarify that, you know, in just a little bit. All right, so I think the folder analogy works okay, okay, understanding what a set is and what is an element in a set. All right, so we can talk about notation now. So the notation, yes. No, not in this class. So maybe in certain branches of math, you know, you can have that happen. Um, there are, in certain branches of math, you can have what we call a multi-set, which means you can have duplicate items in the same set. But in this class, we don't do that. We have you know, all the elements inside a set. They all have to be unique. So in this class, we also do not consider the possibility of a set containing itself as an element. So I think there are some mathematicians you know, in this, on this campus you can ask that quick question about. But in this class, you know, we don't consider that. Okay? We consider pretty normal type of sets. All right, so we'll talk about notations. So if I want to have a set called uppercase T, and in the set I have members, and in this case they're all numbers, they don't have to be, but in this case I have these numbers as members, 12, 5, 2.2, 7, negative 1, and 10 as the only members inside this particular set, this is the notation. The braces are important, okay? Because in mathematical notation, the braces start and end the 
um, containment of what is inside a set. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> then we have another notation. The other notation is an operator. It is usually called element of or in, as in in. Okay, so the operator is also called in. So in this case, you know, 2.2 is in T is a condition. It is not confirming. This is not telling you, it's not asserting that 2.2 as a value is in fact in the set T. It is asking the question of, is it in, in the set T? So 2.2 in T is something that can either be true or false. In this case, because of the way I define T, that condition is true. Is that okay? Because it is important to differentiate between an assertion, which means I'm telling you it is in the set, okay? I'm putting it in the set, as opposed to I'm asking, is it in the set? <clears throat> and then when you look at the other condition or the other expression here, 23, <coughs> excuse me, is in T, that is false because, because the way I define T here, 23 is not one of its members, or if you want to prefer the term element or component, okay, however you want to call that. So are we doing okay so far with those notations? Braces in order to specify the membership inside a set and also the little funny symbol here that is called in so that we can, um, we can check whether something is a member of a set or not. Are we good with that? Okay, all right. So once again, you know, if you want to take your know, really, really neat notes, you know, you can also look into this and find out, you know, how that is entered in LaTeX. So it's 23 backslash in T like that. There we go. All right. So I'm going to, you know, just ask a kind of irrelevant question, you know, irrelevant from the perspective of the core content of this class, but relevant in the sense of how do you take notes? So I can see people using, you know, pen and paper, okay, which works really well. Is anyone taking notes using a uh, computer, you know, typing notes in? Okay, so there are people who are typing notes in. So when you type notes in, you know, are you using a um, note-taking application that can deal with math notations, or are you just kind of typing what is equivalent to the math notation? The, the equivalent? Okay. So there are tools out there, you know, I'm going to introduce just one of them. It's called Joplin. Okay, it's joplinapp.org. <clears throat> so this is an interesting tool. I actually have it installed on my computer. Let me just kind of run it on my computer because I want to show you what it looks like in case someone is interested. Um, once again, this is not something that you have to do. It is just you know, something that I think it's kind of cool. You know, um, if you want to do it, it's like, okay. All right, it opens up on my other side and I'm gonna move it to into the view that you can see. All right, so this is Joplin. And with Joplin, you know, I can go to um, CIFP. This is how I took notes in class or how I show equations in class you know, previously. Um, but I can give you an example of what it can do. So I can put a plus on this side, new to do, new note, there we go. So I'm just going to call this, you know, test here. All right, so if you want to kind of jot down some notes about your know, containment, okay, which is the in operator, you can now say um, uh, the expression, which is your know, x in t, okay, um, is a condition that asks <coughs> whether x is an element of the set. going to close off the these two so you can see how you know it can it, you can basically intermix you know just regular text with uh, LaTeX you know which are enclosed in two dollar signs so once you get proficient with LaTeX this way you know you can actually take notes in calculus 
okay you can take notes in linear algebra you know with you know like the precision you know that you normally associate with textbooks it takes a little bit of time to really get used to it okay so this is not really the um it's not a shallow learning curve but once you get past the learning curve it's a great tool i will show you some other stuff you can do you can do bullet points by just using an asterisk okay this is a point this is another point and then you can use the tab here this is a sub point so you can see how it is e how easy it is this is markdown okay for those of you who don't know this is called markdown which is a markup language yes i just said it it is markdown the the name of the language is markdown but the nature is it is a markup language it is basically a easy way to do html without html instead of having angle bracket open blah 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 as the tag name close angle bracket whatever that tag is open bracket again slash tag name and end you know, bracket this one is easy it's just a whole lot easier to type stuff and for those of you who are taking programming classes and you go like okay but what if i want to you know take a snippet of code that iraj you know is presenting in the class you can do the um, back tick and then you specify the programming language say c plus plus okay and then back tick again whatever is in between is going to be syntax highlighted it understands that whatever is in between is in c plus plus so if you want to say int x uh, int y and you wanted to say i don't know uh, forever do nothing but after that return by you can see how the the rendered version is syntax highlighted and depending on what programming language you're using um, i think there are like a whole bunch of programming languages that it recognizes they can do high syntax highlighting on um, so you can take notes in a programming class you know just by you know jotting down the, the snippet of code that you learn in class um, so i personally think this is a one way to take notes okay you know um some of you okay some people do but many people do not <clears throat> is after you take notes by hand uh some people go home and not only do they review the notes taken by hand they redo everything using a tool like this now how many people do that i don't know okay yeah but some people do that and this is a great tool for doing that too I can do this in real time you know, just because i'm so used to it already um, but if you're just learning you know just warn you that there's a learning curve to it you know i would do it offline and not try to do this while you're trying to capture your notes and your thoughts you know, during a class but once you get used to it this is really great tell me another reason why you might want to learn markdown what resource that people use a lot like developers use a lot make use of markdown as the primary language for documentation starts with g yes github yes so every github has a readme file and what is the extension of that readme file readme.md md stands for markdown okay so if you are going to become a developer or if you're already developing stuff okay and using github and you want other people to get involved and use or use your project learning markdown is great because now you can type up all your documentation using markdown and uh, you type in markdown you check in the file or you can just you know, do it live you know with github but when you when other people see markdown it's already rendered and, red, and markdown can also create graphs yes it will create graphs on the fly using text you know the language is called mermaid okay i know you guys are maybe skeptical about what i just said okay but i'm going to show you that you know it is true okay so you look up uh mermaid and it is also hosted on uh, github so you can look it up and let me see if there are demonstrations tutorials okay and we can look up flowcharts charts 
and you can see how um, okay I'm trying to look up something that's more complex okay it doesn't really show anything that's super complex here you can look at class diagram you know, hopefully you have something that's more oh there we go so the graph is created by using the text description the text description on the other hand is your typical you know okay it's not exactly C++ you know, syntax, but I think it's something that you can learn in half an hour. So this is a great tool for documentation, not only for taking notes in a class like this, but also for all your coding projects, you know, for all the projects on the side that you're doing and whatnot. Um, just want to bring it to your attention, you know, because you know, these are things that can be marketable when you're looking for jobs. Can you imagine what happens when someone is inter interviewing for a job and that person says, I got a straight A coming from this you know, really well-known university in computer science, and then the interviewer go like, okay, can you show me something, you know, your own personal project on GitHub? And then the, the, the applicant just goes like, what is GitHub? Okay, you can leave now. You can save it sometime. You can just go ahead and, <laughs> yep. So all of these things are, just little things that you can build up, you know, along the path before you get your bachelor's degree. All right, getting back to set notations. Other boring stuff. <clears throat> so the equivalency, I'm gonna skip that for now, okay? You know, how do you know that two sets are actually the same? So I'm gonna skip that for a little bit. <clears throat> uh, a set can be an element of another set, okay? So in this case, okay, X is um, a set, how many elements are in X? Okay, just if you look at the uh, pointer, the mouse pointer, how many elements are in uppercase X? So obviously, there are two possible answers, right? One is X has three elements, and then the other one is X has five elements. Which one is it? Three, three okay, three is correct. Because A by itself is an element of X, B is an element of X. The set of one, two, three is an element of X. Remember the folder analogy? X is a folder. It has two files and a subfolder. In that subfolder, there are three additional files. So from the perspective of X as a folder, there are only three icons that you will see when you open that folder. Does that make sense? Okay. <clears throat> uh, one more thing. Do you think we can have a set that has no elements in it? Think about folders, okay? Can you create an empty folder? Okay, so that means, you know, a set can also can have no elements in it. And what do you think is the special name for a set like that? Hmm? It's a null set, that, that's one term, yep, mm -hmm. But what is the more common term? It's an empty set, exactly. It is a set that is empty, there's nothing in it. It's an empty set, okay? What about this, okay? Let me use switch back to this notation here, okay? Just because I'm obsessed with this. <clears throat> what about uh, if I define X like this? The only reason why I stopped doing this is because it takes a little bit of time you know, for the rendered you know, portion to appear. So that's the only reason why I stopped doing it. And I want it to be maximizing. There we go. Okay, what about X defined like this? Does X has one element or no element? It has one element, that's right. So X has one element but that element turns out to be a set that has no element in it. In other words, it is a folder that contains a subfolder. The subfolder itself is empty. Are we good? All right. <clears throat> so getting back to the notes again. How do we describe a set that has an infinite number of elements? Okay. This is all. This happens a lot, okay? Because in this class, uh, we talk about you know a lot of different type of you know sets that have an infinite number of elements. So let me just kind of pause here. 
and we're going to talk about what is what about this name the name of this class is called either discrete structure or discrete math so what do you think that term discrete is describing but don't tell your math professors their branch of math is indiscreet. <laughs> okay, jokes aside, what makes discrete math discrete? Hmm? How many? Sorry? Not exactly. It has to do with whether things are countable or not. Countability. Okay, everything that we do in this class is quote unquote countable. Okay, one, two, three, four, zero. Okay, those are countable. Real numbers are not countable because there's an infinite number of real numbers between any non equal real numbers. But you cannot say the same thing between integers. Between the integer one and two, there are no additional integers, right? That is why this branch of math is called discrete math. It has to do with things are being countable. So we'll get back to that whole countability thing um, because it relates to the set notation, but today we are not gonna focus on that. All right, so what we'll do is we're gonna take a look at a set that has all the even numbers. So if I want to describe E, as a set of even integers. How would I do that? Well, one way that we can potentially do it is to use this notation and just kind of leave it to the imagination of the reader and go like, okay, I think you meant whatever is to the left of the negative four is a negative six, and whatever is to the right-hand side of the four is a six. But does that have to have to be the case? No. It can be negative 8 here, negative 16 on the negative side, and then an 8 and a 16 on the positive side. So this is not a very good way to describe E being a set of all the integers that are even. Hmm. So what would be a good way to do it? This is the notation that we use to describe it. This funky little Z symbol here. It is the set of all integers, okay? So this is a mathematical symbol that most mathematicians and computer scientists recognize, okay? The funny looking Z is the set of all integers. So what this is describing, I'm not enumerating anymore. In other words, I'm not giving you examples. I'm not listing. I'm not you know, giving you all the members within a set. I'm describing who should be in the set. So the way we read this particular description is E is a set in which every element X has to meet the requirement of X has to be an element of the set of all integers and X mod two has to be a zero. That is how we read it. So instead of listing or showing the actual membership of a set, I'm describing who should be in that set. Or the other way to look at it is you know, what properties are we expecting from the members of the set? Okay, so this is an important notation because many things that we're going to deal with is not going to be easy to enumerate. I cannot give you the entire membership of the set. I can only describe what makes an element an element of a set. So if I were to generalize this notation, Okay, I will generalize. I will generalize it like this. Okay, so in this notation, it, it's cleaned up a little bit here. P is called a predicate. A predicate is a fancy name. All that means is P is a function that returns a Boolean value. That's all it is saying. Okay, it is a function that returns either true or false using whatever parameter that you're passing to it. So this notation is basically saying the membership of E is determined by the predicate P. If you can find something where P of, that's something X that makes P of X true, 
then that something would belong to E. If you find something x such that P of x is false, then that something x does not belong to E. That's basically the, the shorthand. So that means now we can make use of the notation that we were defining just earlier, okay? The notation, okay, let me scroll back up a little bit because I want to show you the two notations. This notation here means exactly the same thing as this notation here. I prefer the second notation. The second notation makes sense. It's using you know, just the definition of member of the operator if and only if, and some kind of a predicate to evaluate x so that you can have a true false answer. So this basically means this notation here is a shorthand used mostly by mathematicians and computer scientists to mean exactly this. It's basically saying x is a member of E if and only if P of x is true. Do we have any questions about these notations? Okay, so this class is interesting, not as interesting as 310 in this respect, but it's still interesting in the sense that we build up our vocabulary and also our you know, knowledge of concepts, and you basically have things you know, building up on top of each other. So that means you know, clearing the concepts as quickly as possible before the next lecture is of great importance, okay? I have office hours you know, before the class, okay, every lecture. So I have office hours from 11 to noon, and my office is in uh, room 316, which is really just around the corner. So that means you know, if you want to clear up you know, some of the concepts okay, before class, just come to my office hour, and I'll be more than happy to talk about you know, the concepts that we have been introduced, we have introduced already. Um, well, we are running out of time today, so I'm going to end the lecture here. I do have lecture recording because I got everything set up today, and that will be uploaded. And one thing that you might want to know, okay, if you have taken the class from me already, you don't need this because you already know where to find it. So all the lecture recording, you can find it in my channel, which is some props, some professors. So if you go there, all you have to do is to go to videos. And what that would do is it will list my recording, I think in a chronological order, reversed chronological order. So the latest recording would appear first. Is that okay? All right. So the recording has the date and also the class in it. So my, uh, the last recording in fall 2023 is this particular one. So that means you know, if you want to know what I'm going to talk about on next Monday, you just have to go back to the previous semester of about the same time, and you can pre-watch the whole recording. I don't really teach the classes the same way every single time because I cannot remember how I taught it the last time. So there's that little variability. But if you want to prepare for the class, you know, like for the next class, this is also an additional resource that you can use. All right, okay, so you guys can go. I know you want to get your lunch and whatnot. I'll see you on Monday. Have a nice weekend.